Well, it's good to be here. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Luke, chapter number 1, and verse number 35. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit tonight, folks. This is, um, in most Bible colleges, you've got NUMA, NUMATOS, NUMA uh, 101. And it's a uh, course that they take, and that's when it ends. And they don't really get involved in what's personally, uh, in, uh, personally available and what we should be all about. Luke 1, verse 35, The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And Father, bless your word now. In thy name I pray, amen. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, folks. Uh, the, the highest shall overshadow thee. Literally, she was wrapped in light, and he was born of light. He came from light. He is the light. No darkness in him at all. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's important to understand because the incarnation is important. God became a man. And if he was not man, as I, uh, if he wasn't man, then we don't really have a savior. Remember, I quoted the Pope the other day to you, this, uh, this current Pope, uh, Francis. They call him the Holy Father and all that. He denies the deity of Christ. That's remarkable because the, the Catholic Catechism says plainly that Christ is fully God, fully man. But, uh, you know, it's up to him. He's the one who has to give an account. So, therefore, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God. Not only that, but he was uh, baptized. And, when it, and his baptism, Luke chapter 3, verse 21. And when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. You can't imagine what kind of a solemn scene this was. Look at verse 40, uh, 22. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove unto him. And a voice came from heaven and said... Uh, which said, Thou art my son, my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. This is one of the many times that God affirmed and confirmed the Lord Jesus Christ was his son. Now it was right after this, right after this, that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. But it wasn't before. And first, he had to be anointed. He was, uh, the anointing came from the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, it's a big mistake to take on a ministry to try to do something for God in the flesh. And just because you're excited about it, just because you mean well, that doesn't mean God's going to bless it. And if you try to force the doors open, God will not allow it. He won't let you. You can't force the doors open. God must open the door for you and prepare you for that ministry. The scripture says in Luke 4 verse 1, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So now he has entered it upon his public ministry, 30 years of age. All that time before that, he simply lived like we all live, and he was preparing for that one event where God would anoint him. Here's what John the Baptist said about that in John chapter number 1 and verse number 33. He said, uh, he said in verse number 32, he said, I saw the Spirit, John 1, 32, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. See that? It abode, it remained upon him. Look at verse 33. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me. Now God speaking to John the Baptist. Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. John 3 verse 34. For he whom God hath sent speaks the word of God. For he gives the Spirit to him without measure. Amen. So therefore he was completely empty to be completely filled with the Holy Spirit of God. There's never been a human being that could contain or receive the kind of power that he received. It's very important to understand something. The Lord Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man, but he never did anything in this world as God. In other words, as the second person of the Trinity relying upon his deity and his power. 
What he received from God, the anointing was on the man, Christ Jesus. God did not need to be anointed. The deity of Christ did not need any anointing. And he never gave up his deity. But the, but the man, Christ Jesus, was anointed. In Luke chapter number 4, verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region about So now he is moving about and he's moving in the power of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Ghost. I'll tell you, folks, I've preached for 43 years and I've gotten up here sometimes and I've fought and I've fought and I'm glad it was over. Amen. It's It's just a battle. And I've gotten up here at times and I'm telling you right now, just plugged in and it just flows out like you wouldn't believe. That's the Holy Ghost. And I thank God for it. I don't want to fight him more than I have to. I've done been through enough dog fights in the pulpit to last me a lifetime. He said in John 4 verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. If the Lord Jesus Christ needed to be anointed to preach, don't you think we do? Well, of course we do. This is not something that you say, well, daddy was a preacher and granddaddy was a preacher. I guess it's my place to be a preacher. No, sirree. God calls the preachers. The old timers used to say a God called preacher and they were, they were right, right down the line. That's not to say that you can't minister for the Lord and give out God's word and witness and testify. Anybody can do that. You should be, all of us should be able to do that. Ready to give an account or the hope that's within us. All of us should do that. But when it comes to preaching the word of God, To open the Bible and say, this is what God has given me. That is a blessed, blessed thing indeed. Now, once you do that, once you open up the Bible and stand up in front of people and begin to preach to them, you'd better back up what you preach. What do you mean? If you preach to people to come to church, you need to come to church. If you you preach to people about living right, you need to be living right. Because the truth of the matter is, they're going to watch you. You put a big target on your back the moment that you stand up and announce your calling to preach. He said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And on it goes. The Lord Jesus Christ got up and he quoted the book of Isaiah. And he did because the ministry that he was in was the ministry that God gave him. He didn't choose anything. The Lord gave him everything that he had. He chose to come. But from that moment on, his will was the will of the Father. He said what the Father gave him to say. He went where the Father told him to go because he was completely led of the Holy Spirit. Note carefully, led of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, he was raised from the dead. According to the book of Acts chapter number 1, he was raised from the dead and taken up, ascended into heaven. And this is important because this resurrection from the dead, according to the Apostle Paul, was proof that he was the Son of God. Proof that he was God Almighty's son by the resurrection from the dead. So why would the son, the, God, son, the son of God need the power of the Holy Spirit? Why would he need it? Why would he need that? He would need it because as a man, he did everything he did by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Same power that's available to us today. Same power. No difference because it's the same Holy Ghost And when he ascended to the Father, went to the right hand of the Father, he sent the Holy Spirit into this world. Now the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father. The Greek word is apostello, apostle. That's where we get our word apostle. So therefore the Lord Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit unto this world. And he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, when he comes into this world, doesn't come necessarily as the Holy Spirit. He comes as the Spirit of Of the risen Christ. That's why if the apostle said. If any man have not the spirit of Christ. He's none of his. The resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Comes alive in your life. Not death. Life. I've given to them life. They live. Now if somebody's got to keep you pumped up. Preached up. And uh, worked up. For you to have your Christian walk with God. You're dead. You need the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Well. Should I get the Holy Ghost? No, you need to be born again. And then when you are born again, the Holy Ghost is going to move into you. 
He's going to come in because you can't be saved without him. For by one spirit we are all baptized in one body. It's the Holy Ghost that puts us into the body of Christ. The body of Christ is a spiritual, mystical thing. How could a man do that anyway? It takes the work of the Holy Spirit of God. So the divinity of Christ was not anointed. No, no. But the humanity of Christ was anointed. Now I want you to look at this. Look at Luke chapter 11 and verse number 20. This is quite a thing. Luke 11 verse 20. But if I with the finger of God, notice carefully now, the Lord Jesus is doing everything but the power of the Holy Spirit. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. Now go to Exodus chapter 8 and verse 19. Exodus 8, 19. Notice the term finger of God. That's an Old Testament term. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 19. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. See the graciousness here? But see how it's called the finger of God? Pharaoh was being given an opportunity to get right with God. Now notice what it says in Exodus chapter number 31 verse 18. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. Isn't that amazing? It is. For in the New Testament devils are cast out. By the power of the finger of God. In the Old Testament, Pharaoh is convicted by the finger of God. And then in verse 18 of Exodus 31, the word of God is written in tables of stone with the finger of God. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse number 10, And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spake with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of assembly. So what's all that mean? It means that everything that you need to do, you are equipped with it with the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what that means. And that you can't do anything without the Holy Spirit of God. And a man in his arrogance and his ignorance thinks that he may have a lot of experience. He may, they, may have, they may have blown you up. And you've been patted on the back and they've hung all kinds of medals on you. And you think that can get something done for God. And it cannot. Even to this day, I don't care if you've been saved 150 years. You've got to have the power of the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost. So how does that work? Well, look at Deuteronomy 9.10. I just read to you. A stone written with the finger of God. Now look what Peter says in the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 38. Acts 10 verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. Well, now Jesus of Nazareth came from somewhere, didn't he? Of course he did. He came down from heaven. He didn't originate in Nazareth. <laughs> he, you know, he, was, he identifies with Nazareth because that's his earthly identification. This is what Peter's talking, talking about here. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. So what's it mean to be anointed? It means to be completely set apart to the service of God. That's what the anointing is. The anointing. All of those vessels in the Old Testament, including the high priest and all of that, they were anointed. They were anointed. And the, they had a special anointing oil that they used to anoint them and consecrate them and set them apart under the service of God. Anybody that's in the service of God should take it very seriously. You know, you can build, window, build engines and build houses on one hand, but that's not the same as ministering the Word of God. What's that mean? It means that if you are a true minister of the Word of God, you can go to death row, you can go back into the darkest pits on this earth, and you can carry the Word of God to people that you may not like at all. But if you're a minister of the Word of God, you cannot make a difference. You should be available to everybody. You should be able, when they need you, you should be ready to go to them and help them. Minister to them. Pour in the oil and the wine, if necessary. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. And with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. This is what Peter said. 
Now the same thing over there in the book of Luke chapter 4 verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. For the first 27 years of my life, folks, I was absolutely ignorant of anything I'm telling you tonight. I was ignorant even of the presence of God. I was ignorant to it. I was, it, it no, I, I had, there's nothing in me that could respond to that. Nothing. Nothing. And once you're born again, though, the Spirit beareth witness with our spirit that we are sons of God. You know, a lot of folks doubt. When you're saved, a lot of people doubt. They doubt at times. I, don't, I'm, I understand that. I, you know, I've dealt with people for years. There are times that you may doubt something, but if you'll get on your knees and you'll talk to God and you'll pour your heart out to the Lord, he'll remind you of who you are, where you came from, and then pick up his word and start reading it. He'll start talking to you. The word's a wonderful thing. It is. It's a blessed thing. Now, he's anointed in three different ways. And these are very important. He's anointed as the prophet, he's anointed as priest, and he's anointed as king. Nobody else that ever lived on this earth could be anointed in all three. David came the closest. Prophet, priest, and king. In the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 22, Moses truly said unto the fathers of prophets, Shall the Lord your God raise up unto you like our brethren? Like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say to you. Acts chapter 7, verse 52, which the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. The prophet fits into the category of the one who dies. He takes the place of all the Old Testament prophets who were persecuted and killed, stoned to death. All you have to do is read, Acts, uh, read the book of uh, Acts chapter, or Hebrews chapter 11. And you can see what happened to the prophets, the prophets of the Lord. Amen. They didn't like them. They hated them because their message was not a popular message. When the prophet spoke in the Old Testament, he said, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> thus saith the Lord. That gives a lot, of, a lot of power behind it, right? Well, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he simply came, he, when he came, he said, I have come to set a man against another one, a son against a father, a brother against a brother. He said, how are you going to do this? You're going to get, do it by giving them the truth of the word of God. You'll know tonight how much, you want with, how much you want you want of God by how much you want of the truth. If you really want the truth, you'll get the truth. You'll get it. John said in chapter number one, he's the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He is. And the whole gospel of John has a theme running about the light. If you want the truth, you'll get the truth. Isn't that important? That's a big deal. I want the truth. I want the truth. And I, I'm, I'm not with the crowd that goes around correcting the Bible all the time. I believe the book I got in my hand. I believe the Bible. So therefore, uh, that saves me from a lot of worry. <laughs> because when I pick it up and start reading it, I believe what I'm reading. That makes a big difference. Amen. And I've got lexicons, folks. I've got all that stuff. I've had three years of Greek and two years of Hebrew. I've had all I can go through here and you pick, pick, nit, pick, nit, pick, nit, pick. I still believe the Bible. I believe the book. And that's a, that's a great blessing from God. Prophet. He died as the prophet. He died as the prophet. And then he's the priest. And the priest, by the very nature of it, is someone who represents someone else. He's an intermediary. He's the one who stands in the gap. He's the one that comes between, uh, between one and the other. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 5 says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. This day have I begotten thee. See this? He was not made, he did not make himself a priest. Hebrews 5, verse 6, And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Look at that word Melchizedek. That's a conjunction of two words. Melech in Hebrew is king. Tzedek is righteousness. So his name means king of righteousness. Now here we go. We begin to identify him. He's the priest. What's he going to do then? If he's a priest, he's going to have to do something for us. We need a priest. 
We have a high priest who's entered into the presence of God. We don't need a man on this earth to come between us and God. That's arrogance. We don't need an auricular booth where we have some fellow sitting on the other side and we go in there and we confess our sins to him and then he, ra he, he waves his hand over you and says, my, my, my brother, my sister, your sins are absolved. I'm sorry, you can't even absolve your own, much less mine. <laughs> we all have to give an account. And the only way that sin can be absolved is by the blood of Christ. But here in Hebrews 9 verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he approaches God. For he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He went between the cherubim. That's what this means. He went to the mercy seat. That's what this means. Now I'm going to spend some time with this because this is important. This determines whether you go up or you go down. It's what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not what you do with the church. If you're a Baptist one day and a Presbyterian the next day, that's not going to do anything for your soul. But what you do with the Lord Jesus Christ is going to make all the difference in the world. And the apostle makes it very clear. Chapter number 9, verse 13 of Hebrews. If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit, there's the Holy Ghost, offered himself without spot to God. Notice the offering. He offered himself to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now look at the contrast. The Old Testament saint purified the flesh. The New Testament saint purifies the conscience. Do you know why? Because the Holy Spirit lets you know you are clean and forgiven inside. The Old Testament saint had a remembrance from year to year to year of those sins. He was forgiven, but he could not be cleansed like we are. Why? It takes the blood of Christ to cleanse sin, folks. Not well-meaning, not dedication, and all that's all good. But it takes the blood of the Lord Jesus. Now look how the writer does this. 1 John 2.2 2. And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only. But also for the sins of the elect. No. I messed that up? You caught me, didn't you? What's it say? The whole world. Now notice the word propitiation. What's that mean? That means that two people are warring with each other. There's a wall between them. He took the wall away, took the anger away, satisfied God the Father, and now the Father is happy and has given all judgment to the Son, and the Son therefore becomes the appeasement, the propitiation. And this is connected with the atonement. It's only found two places, this word in the, in the Bible. Look at 1 John 4 verse 10. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for what? Our sins. One of, the, one of the hallmarks of a Christian is that he knows his sins are forgiven. Do you remember Susan Adkins? Do you remember the murderess? Murder? She was a murderer. And I told you how that in that prison cell... She had opened the Bible and she said this light came in and she came into the presence of God and she began to weep and she said, I felt so clean. My sins were forgiven. Well, preacher, I don't think that's fair. It's not a matter of being fair. It's a matter of the blood of Christ. Amen. Making a difference who you are, the blood of Christ. I don't care who you, did, who you are and what you did. We may not like it, but it's not going to change God. His blood will cleanse from all sin. You might be the victim, and you might have ever justifiable right to despise the one that did something to you. I understand that. I do. I'm not overlooking something that important. He may have murdered your mother. He may have murdered your father. He may have murdered your wife or your husband or one of your children. And he's a murderer, and he's guilty, and he's going to hell. But if he confesses his sin and receives the Lord Jesus into his heart, that blood is powerful for him too, just like it is for me and for you. The blood's blind. It's blind. 
It's effectual, completely and absolutely effectual. You let it touch a soul and that soul is clean from that moment on. And so he tasted, the, he, he died for the sins of the whole world. Now you notice this thing right here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. See that? Now I'm going to go back and read 1 John 2 too. And he makes the propitiation for our sins. And not, I noticed some eyeballs here. What am I messing up? Go back and look at it. First John, first, first John 2, 2. This is important. I'm, for, what, I'm, for, I'm trying to force something on you tonight. What does it say? First John 2, 2. And he is what? He is the propitiation. See what I mean? He is. I know what he did, and I thank God for what he did, but it's who he is. That's what matters. Who is he? You see. And of course, he's the Savior of the world. I understand that. But what is he to you? What did John say? He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See that? He is the propitiation. He is salvation. As the Apostle Paul, he is wisdom. He is righteousness. He is sanctification. He is redemption. And these are all wonderful things. They're beautiful things. These are, these are holy things. They're scriptural things. But for you to think that you can approach any of this and have any of this by going around the Lord Jesus Christ or circumventing him in any way, you're like the thief that tries to enter in by the back door by another way won't work God won't let you in the only way you can come in is through the door that Christ opened that's his flesh we have a new and living way not a new and dead way a new and living way our Lord Jesus Christ bless his righteous name there's no name like his name he's worthy of our praise hallelujah I would the Temple Baptist Church would fall in love get carried away become fanatical just get blown away about the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I don't want to be called a fan, fanatic preacher. Are you a fan? We got a whole, we got a hundred and something thousand fans sitting over there on on Tennessee River. Do you know what the word fan came? You know the root for the word fan? What? Fanatic. I'm not trying to be against him or anything like that, but that's what it means. He's everything, or he's nothing. So he's the propitiation. And the apostle lays it out well for our sins. I love that. I love that. Romans chapter number 3, verse number 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. You see, that's a big word. To declare his righteousness. What do you mean that, priest? It means that God will not, will not let the Old Testament saint languish in his sins. When the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross and he died, he died for their sins too. And in Acts chapter number 2, when he talked to Israel, men and brethren, what shall we do? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. All right? He died for the remission of sins. Now, ask you a question. Qu have you ever bought anything? Have you ever purchased anything? Did you, did you, did you ever have anything associated with called a remittance? How many of you remember the word remittance? To remit? What does that word mean? That means you have to give something back, right? You remit. You're a, it's a remittance. You bought a, you got a, you got a, you get whatever it is, nothing, shirt, uh, whatever. Your remittance is what you give for it, what you give back. So when he remitted the sins of Israel, he was literally saying, I'm giving back. And I'm paying for what was done before I showed up. And that's what his blood did. All the sins past, all the sins present, and all the sins future. So you mean to tell me tonight, preacher, that one man, just one man, dying on a cross, shedding his blood, can wipe away all the sins of all humanity, past, present, future? Is that what you're telling me? Yep. 
That's exactly what I'm telling you. And my, I'm going to add this to it. He's the only one that can. I don't care how dedicated you are to Buddha. I don't care how dedicated you are to any of the rest of it. Christ is the only one that can wash away your sins. So he makes it very clear. It is the hilasmos. What is that? That's just a big Greek word that simply means the atonement, a covering. The atonement literally means to cover. In the Old Testament, when Noah built the ark, do you know what he did to the ark? He put the wood together, and then what did he do on the outside of it? He pitched it, all right? Go look up that word pitch. In Hebrew, it is kafir. It literally means to cover, see? Well, the word kafir in the Old Testament directly relates to the atonement. He covers us. Aren't you glad that when you come into the presence of God, He doesn't see you, He sees Christ. I've been covered by the blood, amen? That's a wonderful thing. Praise God. Prophet, priest, he, die, he's, he ministers now as the priest, and then he's the coming king. Hallelujah. Luke 19, verse 38. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. The word Hosanna, you all know what that means? It means save now. Hosanna, save now. Save us now. And if he had saved them then from the Roman oppressor, they would have welcomed him as their Messiah. But he didn't come to save them from the oppressor. He came to save them from sin. He came the first time as the suffering Savior. He'll come the second time as the Son of David, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Hosanna to the Son of David. Now when they cried out, Son of David, you remember the blind man? You remember him? He said, he said, Oh, thou Son of David, have mercy on me. He was appealing to him, saying, I am a Jew. I am an Israelite. So are you. And you are the king that's come in the name of the Lord because you're the son of David. That's important. Look at Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew 1. Remember, the gospel of Matthew is written by Levi, and it's all about the kingdom. The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Time and time and time and time and time again. And there's a reason for that. Because they present you with the king. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the generation, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now what's wrong with that chronology there? How, when did Abraham live? Pardon? Yeah, long, yes. 1900 B.C. David is about 1000 B.C. You're looking at 900 years. And yet, when the genealogy is laid out for you here in Matthew 1, he puts David above Abraham. Well, one of the reasons is because Abraham didn't come to give a kingly line. Abraham's the father of the faithful. But David, what did God say to David? He said, there shall never fail a what? One of your man to sit on the throne of Israel. And the Bible says he gave him the sure mercies of David. When the Lord Jesus Christ showed up as the son of David, he's simply saying these are his credentials to be the king. And so when they cried out and said to them, Oh, thou son of David, this is a Jew, an Israelite, Hebrew, calling out and saying, I know who you are. You're the king. And I appeal to that kingdom, to that kingship, to that, to, to that. And he did. But now he's not the king in this world. Not in that sense. He's the coming king. Revelation 19 Saw heaven open, behold a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And he had a vesture, and on his vesture was written the name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All the kings will bow to that king. All the lords will bow to that lord. There's none higher. King of Kings. He's coming. As he comes to the king, he brings the kingdom. Amen. Father, bless your word tonight. Do everything I can to exalt the Lord Jesus. Lift up his righteous name. There's no other name like his name. I must decrease. He must increase. I must fade away. He must be exalted and brought to the forefront. And as long as we do that, as long as we understand that, that he must be primary, he must be first, he must be first in everything, he has the preeminence. 
will do well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.